Do they ever return to possess a living? The story is there's a governess, she's looking after these two children and uh, she thinks that the children harbour something supernatural, something demonic. She thinks she's in a house and she believes that the house is actually possessed of ghostly spirits and somehow the children are involved. I saw him staring. Who, miss? The same man, the man on the tower. If you knew the premise and you'd seen this trailer, you could be forgiven for thinking that the innocence was just a piece of B-movie schlock. No! But that is not the case. It's not the case at all. Not only is it one of the greatest horror movies, it's one of the greatest of all movies. But why? Well, despite the idiotic question that the trail keeps asking, do they, they, they ever return to possess the living? The real theme of the innocence is ambiguity. How long have you been here? I don't know. Twenty minutes, half an hour. Oh, then you must have seen him. The whole essence of the tale is there's an ambiguity as to what it's whether what's happening is happening in the world or whether what's happening is happening in her mind and she's kind of projecting. Not two minutes ago I saw a man standing exactly here. Perhaps it was me. No, no, it was a man. And whilst we can argue over whether the ghosts are real or not, it's not as simple as one explanation being right and the other wrong. I do remember saying to Jack, do you think she really sees these spooks, as it were? Or is it all in her mind, and is she just going around the bend a little bit, out of frustration? And he said, you make up your mind. So what we have here is a conflict between two reasonable, but wholly irreconcilable explanations. And from this conflict arises a new idea, ambiguity. This is dialectics. It's very simple dialectics. That might be true, but it's worth keeping in mind because ambiguity is too often thought of as merely an absence of clarity or even a deliberate confusion. But that is not the case. As the director Alexander McKendrick explains in his book on filmmaking, ambiguity does not mean a lack of clarity, but rather it consists of a contrast between alternative meanings, each of them clear. And though it may seem counterintuitive, that's the key. That the elements that create ambiguity have to be clearly stated. So in the case of the innocence, we've established the ambiguity, either the ghosts are real or their delusions. But these options to be clear, they have to be plausible. And to be plausible, they have to be believable. The ghosts have to be tangible enough that they could be real, but you also have to establish the possibility that the governess, Miss Giddens, might not be of sound mind. Who is it? The first point is relatively simple, but it's the second that poses a problem. How do you establish that your protagonist might be the sort of character who is prone to such hallucinations and delusions without going full Nicholson? <laughs> the answer? Through the power of suggestion, by planting seeds of doubt and planting them early. From the very first scene, in fact, and that's what I want to look at in this video. Do you have an imagination? On the surface, this scene could appear to be nothing more than a massive exposition dump. It is a lengthy conversation between two characters, one of whom never appears in the film again. Truth is very seldom understood by any but imaginative persons, and I want to be quite truthful. And the dialogue lays out the terms okay. of the narrative and fills in some backstory for both the story to come and for I spend a great deal of time abroad, and as for my London life, well. <laughs> It amuses me, but it's not the sort of amusement that one could suitably share with children. But what is interesting is that on an expositional level, it's completely redundant. A lot of what we learn through the dialogue could be inferred through later exchanges in the film. Two orphaned infants. It's most unfortunate, for I have no room for them, neither mentally nor emotionally. You can't think what your uncle will say. Can't you? I can. You so say, don't bother me, I'm too busy. Oh, that's not true, isn't it? Does that seem quite heartless? Honest, but not heartless. So why is this scene here? Like I said earlier, it's all about planting seeds. There are just enough of them sown throughout the dialogue that, if taken in conjunction with the filmmaking, will grow into the suspicion that Miss Giddens is not of sound More than anything, I love children. Yes. How remarkable. And all these little nuggets are supported by the filmmaking itself. The acting, the cinematography and the editing all work to undermine the stability of Miss Giddens. So let's start this scene over and take a look at it in greater detail to see how some of these uncertainties are planted. 
First, some simple stats. At approximately 4 minutes, this scene has a total of 15 shots from 10 different setups, with an average shot length of 15.6 seconds. This shot length is an eternity by modern standards, but it was also well above average for the early 60s when the film was made. In fact, it's actually close to the ASL of the silent period. But why? Well, let's think about it. What do more recent films with a lower ASL have that silence didn't? And now came talk. Talk, talk. Exactly. So the length of the shot is saying that though the dialogue is important, it is not exclusively so. It's saying pay attention to the image, and even more importantly, the cut. Because when the shots are this long, it means that the cuts are being chosen precisely. Let me give you an example. Here, when Miss Gideon shies away from the uncle's gaze, take note of this cut. Up until this point, Miss Giddens is being shot from either front or on, or from the right, but now we're on her left. So what motivates this shot? Is it the uncle's point of view? It's not really the right angle for that, because the eye lines don't match up. Rather, I think we're best thinking of this shot as suggesting his presence, his closeness to her, or more specifically, her acute awareness of this closeness. But with that in mind, have a look at the next shot. Does something seem off? Well, let's compare it to the one previous to the single. The uncle is in a different position. Now, is this just a continuity gap, or is this deliberate? Because if it is the latter, that opens up a whole lot of questions. Because what up until now we had assumed to be an objective scene might in fact be something more subjective. But what does this mean? Well, remember when I said that the aim of this scene was to foster suspicion about her mental state? There are many interpretations of Henry James's original novella, but there is one that is particularly pertinent to this film. Clayton had read a famous essay by the literary critic Edmund Wilson, written in the mid-30s, called The Ambiguity of Henry James. And Edmund Wilson made all sorts of slightly sort of crude Freudian suppositions about this, that basically it's an early version of a kind of projection story, it's not a ghost story at all. Jack Clayton was very taken with this, but he didn't want it to dominate the film. He wanted ambiguity to be throughout, so the audience wouldn't quite know whether this is a story of a frustrated governess or whether it's a real ghost story. So we have to ask, was he ever really this close to her? Or is what we're seeing some sort of subjective manifestation of a subconscious attraction? Because that is a suggestion that runs throughout not only this scene, but the entire film. After all, I didn't have much choice. Their uncle is most persuasive. <laughs> oh, and don't I know it. Point in case, look at how this interaction is staged and shot. Look at the coy manner in which she turns away. Because the eye lines up until now have been so consistent, breaking them draws our attention, and we notice the strange, insatiable look in her eye. This is a subtle seduction, with Miss Giddens allowing the uncle to flatter her into acquiescence. I feel that you are that person. And that's an idea that is supported by this statement. Give me your hand. Give me your promise. Indeed, if we drop the sound and take the image out of context, what does it look like? Miss Giddens stands to meet the uncle. The camera closes in, emphasising the intimacy. He takes her hand in his. Certainly doesn't look like a job interview. This could be a love scene, imploring impassioned declaration of love. And just look at the way she reacts, like a smitten teenager. Of course the dialogue doesn't support this reading, but that is the point, the dialogue is just text. What is being presented to us through the filmmaking is subtext, and the audience registers it, consciously or not. And so the intensity of the performance works hand in hand with the suggested staging, and that colors our understanding of the information that is being fed to us through the dialogue. She's the daughter of a country priest. This is her first position, Thus, she's sheltered, she's cloistered, she's inexperienced. And from there, it's just a hop, skip and a jump to, she's frustrated. And so, when she sees the ghosts that no one else can see, it's not too big of a leap to read it as, she wants to see ghosts. And that sets us up for the rest of the narrative. But the foundations that allow for such connections to be made have to be sturdy. And as we've seen in the opening scene, they are. And they were laid with the skill and subtlety of the highest order.